If you see the distal radial nerve joint is a pivot for your pronation and supination. That's how your rotations are affected in this particular pathology. And if you see the, there's a difference in the curvature of the radius as well as the ulna at this level. So the joint as such is not stable. It depends a lot on soft tissue stabilizers. And here comes the picture of the TFCC. And uh, if you see uh, the attachment of TFCC is in a particular point called as the fovea, which is uh, devoid of any articular cartilage on the ulna head. So uh, coming to the complex proper, this was described by Palmer and Werner. And uh, the primary component, that's the primary stabilizer of this joint is the radio ulnar ligament. Again, two components, radial volar, superficial and deep. And uh, if you see the, what's the concept of stability, the one what we see from the joint proper is only the superficial part, which is just a shock absorber. While the deeper invisible part from the routine wrist scopy is the one which is a primary stabilizer. So once the deep foveal attachment is gone, you're just TFCC starts floating up and you start up develop this instability and the other components of your uh, complex are the articular disc which is a primary shock absorber with minimal role in stability and uh, then you have your ECU sheath, alnocarpal ligaments, all of these have a role and some dynamic stabilizers like your ECU tendon and pronator quadratus and some role of the interosseous membrane as such in this uh, stability pattern. So if you see uh, DRUG instability, you can see them in a variety of injuries. It could be isolated DRUG injury, acute or chronic. It can be associated with distal radius fractures or with galeazy fracture dislocations with associated ulna stellate fractures or sometimes a chronic presentation or associated with arthritis. If you see the acute uh, DRUG injuries isolatedly are predominantly because of TFCC injuries and there is a classification by Palmer. Class 1 is a traumatic one which we are routinely concerned of. This uh, presents with the ulnar side wrist pain with or without clicking. When you try to reciprocate uh, with the axial loading, they start developing pain. There is tenderness at the fovea. And uh, when you try to compress this, uh, the TFCC compression test is usually pos positive. You compress and rotate the forearm to locate which component could be the pathology. Then you check for the translation of your distal radial ulnar joint. And in chronic cases, you may find your piano key sign. You just push it in and it starts popping out. So when you see a patient with uh, acute painful DRUJ, so what matters is whether this joint is stable or unstable. If it is stable, though they are in pain, it's actually possible to assess that. And you just need a above splint in four to six weeks of neutral rotation and reassess after duration of six weeks. But if you are suspecting instability, then the plausible attach, uh, lesion here could be a foveal detachment. That would be a 1B Palmer uh, injury and that's where the picture of MRI comes in. And if you have a significant tear in a high demand patient, you can either go for an arthroscopic or open TFCC repair. That's a type 1A tear, a central perforation post-traumatic and usually central perforations are treated by debridement. And uh, if like in a degenerative tear, you may add a wafer resection or ulnar shortening to take care of your uh, ulna positive variants. Yeah. So, uh, and a type 1B tear is where uh, you are under surface, that's the foveal attachment is gone. There are indirect signs like your trampoline sign is positive, the tautness is lost. You can actually hook up the entire TFC complex up, like with a hook. You see it's totally unstable in the uh, small video that's being played down. And there are many ways of treating this acute DRUJ instability. If you find a peripheral tear, a massive peripheral tear, in spite of having an intact fovea, also can have a significant instability. So we do a outside in repair. That's the commonest way of doing it, sometimes inside out. But the, if your pathology is in the fovea, you definitely have to reattach your uh, disc or the ligaments back to the fovea. And uh, there are many ways, arthroscopic or open. And uh, the routine way of doing it is uh, arthroscopic transosseous repair where tunnels are passed across the fovea and you pass sutures, loops and uh, non-absorbable suture is taken. Fiber wire of configuration 2.0 is passed and then you just pull it down to the fovea and either tie it on a bone of bridge or a push lock anchor. That addresses your instability part and this patient like the video shows it's also got a massive dorsal peripheral tear. So here you also do an outside in repair of this uh, dorsal peripheral tear. So that complex, whether it's a massive dorsal tear or a foveal tear, sometimes have to be addressed incomplete. 
and most of these patients end up with a plaster a bulbo or a sugar tong kind of splint for a duration of one month and then go ahead with your rehab so on an average we say it takes about 6 to 8 weeks for the rehab process to complete and get back to work and the minor patterns like majority of them just go for a debridement and when you see these injury instability pattern associated with a distal radius fracture the incidence is almost 80% and the risk factors at time of presentation if the patient shows max a uh, very wide displacement or there is severe shortening of radius that's when you expect the complex to be torn and uh, whenever you fix them you have to follow the parameters like the radial shortening should not be more than 5 the inclination angulations only when you restore the radius you can expect the ligaments to heal properly so intraarticular fractures again have a significant role in in, in this instability and it's always your uh, fixation that is important so whenever you find a distal radius fracture the first thing to do is anatomical fixation you can't expect stability to restore with a suboptimal fixation so after your anatomical fixation then assess it again if you find instability only in a particular position you can pin it or put a cast it doesn't really matter but if it's a multidirectional or a bidirectional instability preferable to go for an open or arthroscopic tfc repair in the same setting and the other pattern is where we see the gallies injuries again here the distance from the joint has some particular significance like in type 1 injuries where it's within 7.5 cm the incidence is more and type 2 where the it's much far away the incidence is less so again the anatomical reduction of radius is of paramount importance here and after fixation if it is reduced and stable just immobilize if it is reduced and unstable without a fracture just pin or cast it with the fracture try to fix the ulna stator fracture and pin and cast him but sometimes you find irreducible drug dislocations in galliasi where you need to bring out the interposed tissue where ecu is the primary pathology and isolated ulna styloid fractures again basal fractures are the one which are supposed to be the culprit which add to this instability indications of uh, fixation are young patients basal fractures high demand patients heavy laborers and there are many ways of fixing it a simple k wire but preferable to do it by open procedure you can never get a styloid fixed by closed procedure you can use steam tension band wiring or headless screw depending on the size of the fragment coming to chronic one chronic pattern is seen in chronic tfc injuries more than 6 months as other also with malunited distal radius fractures sx low prestige injury mid lung deformities they present with loss of strength weakness instability piano keys and positive tranquilis translation and the aim here is to correct the bony alignment if you have anything and to rule out arthritis only then we progress with your ligament reconstruction and the procedure of what we routinely do is the adams procedure that's a reconstruction using palmaris longus graft so uh, uh, instability pattern on table is shown better under anesthesia and you go ahead with your tunnels on the radius the graft is passed and you routinely expect a reasonably good result with this reconstruction there are other procedures like if you have arthritis and instability no point in going ahead with reconstruction like you have your sarcopanji procedure which is a procedure of choice in young patients and uh, darax darax as a routine is not routinely done because there's a chance of radial ulnar impingement what we do is a modified darax especially in low demand elderly patients where you put a tether of ecu tendon to prevent that impingement from happening and uh, i think that's all thank you